Well, today's sermon is only going to work if some of you here today came with some anxieties. So if anyone is here with at least one thing you're dealing with in life that is making you anxious, give me an amen. Okay, fantastic. Then I'll go ahead with the sermon that I was hoping to preach. Um, Luckily, my backup, if nobody amen, was about lying, because I I would have known that y'all weren't being honest if no one said they were anxious. Uh, So we can skip the lying part. You've been very honest and transparent. Um, As has kind of been mentioned as we've been preparing uh, through our worship, I've got good news for us today. The good news today is that according to the Lord's word, Uh, anxiety is not meant to be your way of life that's not what God wants for us Uh, it isn't what he calls us to it is not what he equips us moment by moment for Uh, but uh, as most of us I assume with all those amens have come to know uh, coming to a place where anxiety isn't our way of life is a process Uh, it's a journey Uh, And we're all going to be somewhere on that journey if if we are followers of Christ. For me, for example, I have certain anxieties. And it's interesting how everyone's can be very different. Um, My anxieties right now in my life tend to be about my kids. I have two teenagers. About their faith, their safety, their well-being, their future, their success. Anybody here with kids or grandkids? Do you ever get anxious about those things? Absolutely. Absolutely. We were in Canada this last week on vacation, went to Montreal and went to Quebec City for one night. And so we were staying in a hotel for several nights in downtown Montreal. And every night at about 930, James said, I think I'm going to go out for a walk. And every night I would get nervous. Um, Okay, none of us know anything about Montreal, right, other than what we walked and saw that day. Um, I don't know what it's like at night compared to what it's like in the day. Where we were was pretty safe. But I also recognize James is 19, right? He's not a child anymore. So he's got to learn how to use his freedoms and explore it. I don't want him to be afraid of the world, you know. So I would let him go. And uh, then I would uh, look at my phone to see where he was. Was he moving, right? You know, I'm... (laughs) Because my anxieties tend to be about my kids, I love Live 360. Maybe you use Apple or something, the the app where you can see a human being who has their phone moving around. Um, Similarly, Ellie, she's getting to that age where her friends are starting to drive. And so several weeks ago, this was a first. She and a friend went to Fall Creek Falls. And, and, you know, my 15-year-old daughter is in a car with another teenager driving several hours to go hiking. And I'm watching that, that Live 360. And unfortunately, when you get to Fall Creek Falls, you don't have a signal. So it looked like they just broke down on the side of the road for an hour and a half. All I could see was Ellie has been for an hour and a half by the side of the highway close to, to Fall Creek Falls. Um, so I spend a lot of my time on that app. Um, because of my anxieties. Um, But let me remind us of of a lesson Jesus taught in that famous Sermon on the Mount. It's not our focus scripture today, but I want to remind you that Jesus told us that anxiety and worry is not productive. You remember that? You remember how Jesus said when he was preaching, he said, don't be anxious about your life. And he went on to say, which of you, by being anxious, how many of you, by worrying about things, can add a single hour to the length of his life? You can't, right? It doesn't accomplish anything. Anxiety and worry. You can go back to Luke 12 if you want to read Jesus in context, talking about that. Jesus was very clear. Anxiety is not productive. Uh, It doesn't change anything. It doesn't control anything. It doesn't make things better. Today, we're going to see as we continue studying Philippians that that worry and anxiety is not only not productive, it is counterproductive because what God offers to us and wants for us is joy. You know that? And, And maybe today 
you might need to start with this. God, I will take you at your word that you actually want me to have joy. For some of us, that alone is a huge step of faith. To think, and after all I've been through in my life, that God wants me to have joy, that's hard to believe. But it is what he says. But to get there, to get to that place of joy, we have to relinquish anxiety and worry because it is competing for our our mental and spiritual and emotional resources, and it is disabling to the experience of joy. So let's read about this. We're taking Philippians 4 slowly. I mentioned last week there's so many good verses in this chapter Uh, All of the Bible is good, but some speak so powerfully, and you you don't have to study to understand what it means. This is one of those. We're going to read today Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, just three verses. And so let me remind you that this is God's Word. It is the truth. So let's listen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness Be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful truth today. So notice the theme of this kind of short passage right at the beginning. Rejoice. Rejoice. Paul says it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. What does it mean to rejoice? Well, it's not complicated, Um, rejoice is basically a verb where we take the word joy joy is a thing and to rejoice is to have joy to be filled with joy to be glad to be filled with gladness that's what it means to rejoice to be joyful Paul obviously believes this is really important Uh, we see that in one way because he repeats it right he doesn't do this with everything but he says Rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you didn't hear that, or in case you don't think I'm serious, or in case you don't really believe God wants you to do it, let me say it again, Paul says. Again, I say, be joyful. Practice having joy. Practice being glad. Why do you think it's so important to Paul that he commands this twice? Rejoice be joyful. Uh, I would say that perhaps it's because Paul really believed the message of Jesus Christ is the gospel. What does that mean? Good news, right? Paul really believed that those angels, when Christ was born, remember what they said? They brought good news of what? Great joy that would be for all the people. See, Paul believes this. What Christ has done for you and for me is good news. And we should rejoice. We should have joy. Paul believed that is what Christ came to do. He believed it because of his own experience. I think Paul knew the joy of the Lord. And he knew it because of what Christ had done for all of us. That that is God's will. And again, some of us need to today stake our claim on that truth that God wants for us joy. Because I can guarantee you all of us have been at some point in our lives where we probably felt like God was trying to take our joy away. Ever been there? Yeah, he's not. He's not. We have to understand that joy in the Lord, remember Paul said rejoice in the Lord. That's not the same as just be happy, right? You know, I could have called this sermon, if you're old enough, you might remember, I could have said this sermon title is Don't Worry, Be Happy. Right? Remember Anybody remember that song? That's a, a great song from my high school days. But Paul didn't just say, don't worry, be happy. He said, rejoice in the Lord, always. I don't think our concept of God always 
is associated with joy. I think about, have you ever seen Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel where it's like God's created Adam or is creating him? I don't quite know, but he's, God's kind of being surrounded by angels and he's reaching over and touching Adam. Nobody looks happy in that painting. God doesn't. He's got a long white beard. He's kind of austere looking. Adam doesn't look happy. Um, we don't always think about God as joyful. But remember these words Jesus said in John 15, 11. I mentioned them. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken to you, I speak so that my joy, Jesus says this, I want my joy to be in you so that your joy may be full. See, not only does God want us to have joy, he wants us to be filled with joy. And, and understand this. God is joyful. Despite what the paintings might show, it's hard for us to picture God himself, the creator, is joyful until we think about Jesus. Jesus who said, I came so that you could see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was joyful. And he says, I came that my joy would be in you. And your joy would be complete. So what does God want for you? To have the same joy that he has. And God is filled with joy inexpressible. So... How often, according to Paul, and when should we be joyful? Well, he says rejoice in the, the, the Lord when? Always. Now, let's be honest, that seems kind of weird. That kind of sounds impossible. There's too many things in life that happen where it's not joyful, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. God could have said most of the time, maybe. Nope. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always always. And again, I say rejoice. It sounds kind of impossible, but listen, if our joy is joy from the Lord, does God stop being joyful? No, nope. it is who he is. It is his nature, his character. It doesn't stop for him, so it doesn't have to stop for us, even when we might not be happy, even when things are hard. Now, Paul is not in denial, right? Don't think this. Paul isn't sticking his head in the sand. He's not saying just ignore reality, plug your ear holes and cover your eyes and, and hum a happy tune or something like that. Paul is not into some weird spiritual realm where there's, there's sort of a strain within Buddhism that says that suffering isn't real, it's an illusion. Right? Paul's not saying that. Uh, Paul is urging that we rejoice even when we suffer because Jesus is still with us. The Lord is at hand. Did you hear that phrase in there? This is a key to joy. No matter what you're dealing with today, no matter when you said amen, if I said, do you have any anxieties? Whatever you're dealing with, did you know the Lord is at hand? He's right here with you. He's your strength. He's your shield. He is your refuge. He is working all things together for your good if you love him and if you've placed your faith and your trust in him. There's reason to rejoice even today, whatever you're facing, whatever I'm facing. Now, we've got to remember as we read this that Paul was an expert in suffering. This man suffered tremendously in 2 Corinthians 11, I'll read you a description of Paul talking about his life. And listen to this. Paul says, he experienced countless beatings and was often near death. And all of this was for his faith, by the way. He said, he experienced countless beatings and was often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews 40 lashes, lest one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That means they threw stones at him, in case you're wondering. Sometimes we say somebody was stoned, it means something else. <laughs> Paul meant they, they pelted him with stones to kill him and left him for dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. One night and day I was adrift at sea. Paul literally shipwrecked, floated around in the sea for a day and a night. 
on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, from my own people, the Jews, from the Gentiles, danger in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from this, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety, Paul said, for all the churches. Paul knew the struggle of anxiety and worry and suffering. And remember, where was Paul when he wrote this letter saying, rejoice in the Lord always? Anybody remember? He was in jail. He was in a Roman prison. He used that very word. He said, and on top of all of these other things, the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for the churches that I planted that I love so much. Paul knew the burden of anxiety and worry and hardship. But Paul also knew the antidote to anxiety and worry. And in this letter that he wrote from prison, he uses it over and over. Joy, rejoice, joy. This letter, Philippians, a lot of times it's called the joy letter. It uses that word more than any other. This letter that Paul wrote while suffering in a Roman prison. Now, one of the reasons Paul, I think, says rejoice in the Lord, have joy. And and again, I'm going to say to you rejoice is... He understood that Christians will not have a witness if they don't have joy. And I'll I'll say that again. If you're a Christian and you want others to know that, you want your faith to be something that that serves as a, a means to tell other people about Christ, to share what he's done so that they could have joy. If you don't have any, you don't have a great witness. And so Paul says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. I think this is Paul reminding us, look, believers, you're called to be a a witness for Christ. And if you don't have joy, there's something wrong. I, I, I sort of see this, let your reasonableness be known kind of in two ways. One way is that a joyful person will be reasonable. But have you ever noticed the more anxious you get? the harder it is to behave reasonably. All right. I have to confess, yesterday was not a good day um, in preparation for preaching this sermon. Um, We were coming home from Canada, and we um, had a layover in Atlanta. It was a very weird week. We flew out of Knoxville, but we flew back to Atlanta, then to Knoxville. Um, And our, our connecting flight in Atlanta to Knoxville was at midnight. And we had about 20 minutes from the time we landed to get to the other place to board. And Atlanta's big. You've been to their airport. It's big. So I'm trying to rush us. Like, we got to go. we got to go. So we're hustling down. The train comes, and it stops, and we have to go to another concourse. So there's, like, I don't know how far we have to go. It's going to be a long way. And the doors open on the train, and it's packed. And I'm like, come on, we're going to make our way. And so I just kind of push through the people and say, come on, James and Ellie. And I'm pushing through, trying to make room behind me. And I turn around, and they're looking at me like, not getting on. Psh, the doors close. Off I go. And I'm looking at them like, I am so mad at you. People, people around me were all like, oh man, we're so, we feel bad. So off I go and I leave James and Ellie. We've got 19 minutes now to get to the place where we're supposed to work. And I was furious. I mean, I, I lost it because of my anxiety. I'm like, number one, I don't know if we're going to make our connection. I don't know how long it takes for the next train to come. I don't know if they're, where I'm going to be, if they're going to go get off at the same place. So I'm just kind of having a meltdown, and I'm so angry. So I get out, and I'm waiting, and I'm fuming around. And, you know, two minutes later, the train pulls up. There's no one in it but James and Ellie. They, they step off. And I'm like, don't even talk to me. Just go. I'm running. And uh, finally, I calmed down, and I apologized. And they told me, Dad, if we tried to get on that train, we were going to get crushed by the doors, and we don't know why you wanted us to die. They guilted me, (laughs) totally guilt-tripped me. And I'm like, there's no way Atlanta's airport is going to have the technology where the doors shut on people and kill them. This is kind of how this was going. I was being unreasonable. 
uh, my anger level and frustration because of my anxiety of getting to the place on time, I was not reasonable. Anybody else ever been there? Your anxieties cause you to become unreasonable. And listen, that was not my best witness to my kids of the love of Christ, the joy of the Lord, right? So I did apologize, you know, and it wasn't even one of those, well, I'm sorry if you didn't like my behavior. It was a real, like, my behavior was, I shouldn't have been that mad, so I, I apologize. So listen, we can become very unreasonable when we let our anxieties and our fears and our burdens and our worries weigh on us and we don't do anything with them. I think another reason Paul says, let your reasonableness be known, is because the reality of the whole situation for Christian is this. If what you say you believe about God is true, you don't need to be anxious, right? Your faith doesn't make a lot of sense when you say, well, I believe God is for me, not against me, but you're riddled with anxiety all the time. That's not reasonable, is it? It's not reasonable to say, I believe God will provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory, and then freak out when some need is unmet, right? Like, if what we believe is true, we wouldn't be overwhelmed with anxiety and worry and fear and all of these things. Um, I remember when my dad was at a phase in his life where he was kind of agnostic. Um, we were on a boat one time and it was really foggy and my mom was freaking out because we couldn't see about eight feet in front of us and we, we were, it was just us and we were trying to get from one place to another and um, my mom was just super worried and my dad said, honey, he said, you're the strongest Christian I know. Don't you believe God's going to take care of us? Why are you so upset? It was a confrontation to this idea that, look, Christians, if you say you believe God loves you, and he's faithful, and he's good, and he's with you, and he doesn't leave you or forsake you, and he's at hand, like, should you be that freaked out? Should you be that anxious? No. So remember, if what we believe is true, the reasonable response is, to have trust in the Lord, not to be overwhelmed with anxiety and fear. Jesus, remember when he was in the boat with his disciples and the storm came at night and the waves were filling the boat and they were all panicking. And what was he doing? Sleeping. And they went to him and they woke him up and he said, he calmed the waves and the storms. And he said, why are you so afraid? You know what Jesus was saying? Your fear isn't reasonable. Don't you know what I can do? Don't you know what the Father will do? Why are you so afraid? He said, have you still no faith? Jesus was saying with them, you don't need to be so afraid. So, there is a method to move from our anxiety to rejoicing. And Paul gives it to us. It is the prescription for whatever trial you face whatever season you are in, whatever circumstances you are battling, Paul says this, do not be anxious about what? Anything. Wow, he set the bar high, didn't he? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. What? By prayer and supplication. Some of your Bible translations say petition. Basically, you pray and you ask God. He says you present your request to God. So this is what you do. When you start feeling anxious, what should we do? Stop and do what? Pray, right? Take the request to God. Instead of taking it to your mind and worrying and getting like me yesterday, melting down, I should have just stopped as that train whistled me away from my kids. All right, Lord, you love James and Ellie and you love me. So just get us back together here at the next train stop and get us to our train on time, plane on time. That's what I should have done, and I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a bad example to you all. Paul says, in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. See, you can always give thanks to God, always. I could have said, God, I just got separated from my kids in the Atlanta airport. We're in a big hurry, but I'm grateful to have smart kids. 
I'm grateful that I can trust them not to go do something crazy, right? Like, and there were, there were things, if I tried, I could have been thankful for. I could have said, Lord, I'm thankful that the, the, the train's on one line, so there's not a lot of room for mistakes here, right? There were things I could have given thanks for. But he says, if you do this, Instead of being anxious, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. What's going to happen? The peace of God that surpasses our ability to understand it. I think this goes back to what Jesus said, I came that my joy would be in you. We don't understand that. It's hard for me to understand. It's supernatural. But Paul says, yes, indeed, If we will do this, the peace of God that transcends understanding will do what? Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. God has given us a supernatural antidote to anxiety and a supernatural path to joy. And it doesn't depend on your circumstances. It depends on him because he gives us himself. I want you to remember something Jesus also said in Matthew 7. Remember this. Jesus said, if you humans who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Hmm. Remember that when you get anxious. That Jesus promised that he knows more about giving us the good things we need like his joy and his peace than we understand. But what did he say gives it to who? Those who ask him. See, God is always drawing us into a relationship with him, to love him, to walk with him, to follow him, to do our part, to give ourselves in love and faith to him. So my hope today is that that is what we will do, that we will put into practice being anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, to believe that God wants joy for you and me, to believe that God gives us his joy, that it is ours for the taking if we will do what? Ask him. And when that anxiety arises, I don't care if it's the first time it's something that's worried you or something you've worried about your whole life. When it comes, stop. Remember this. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that you will not understand, he says, and the joy that comes with it, will guard your hearts and your minds and mine in Christ Jesus. Let us today take our anxieties to him. Believe that he wants joy for us today. And let us ask him for it. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you today that you are a God of joy. We thank you, Lord, that that is who you are. And we thank you today, God, that we, as those you have created in your image, you have created for joy, that it is your will for us to be filled with joy, that it is even your will for us to learn a way of life where we are anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we may receive when we ask for it the peace of God that transcends understanding and opens the door for joy. Father, we confess today exactly who and where we are. Lord, we are an anxious people. I am. And Lord, we ask today that you will help us to see a better way, the truth, the way of Jesus Christ, who said that the words he spoke, he spoke that his joy would be in us. Lord, we want your joy today. We don't want to be people who are riddled with anxiety and fear and worry. But Lord, sometimes it's about the only way we know. And I pray today, Lord, you will break the bonds of anxiety in our lives. 
I pray today you will give us, Lord, the gift of faith to believe that you are joyful, to believe that you want joy for us, and, Lord, to do what we have been instructed by Paul to do, to receive it. So during this time now, Lord, we come to you in prayer and petition and supplication, thanking you, God, that you've invited us to pray, thanking you, God, that you love us and you listen to us and you receive us, and thanking you, God, that you work on us and you work in us, and thanking you, God, that you give us your joy. We want it. Fill us with your joy today. Fill us with the peace that guards us from fear and anxiety, that surpasses our understanding. And Lord, may we today know the supernatural, divine joy that comes when we rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we will ask that, God, you will help us to rejoice. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, and together we say today, amen.